we made it possible in the last decade to scale artificial intelligence and scale machine learning by one million times. Increasing the scale of machine learning by one million times enabled, of course, the incredible breakthrough that we now know ChatGPT, the advent of artificial intelligence. AI will not take your job. AI used by somebody else will take your job. And so, therefore, as the world continues to absorb and ad embrace artificial intelligence, it is our mission, it is our duty to continuously drive the performance up as fast as we can. NVIDIA invented accelerated computing. Accelerated computing does not replace the CPU. In fact, we were just about the only company in computing who did not want to replace the CPU, but to augment the CPU so that we can take the workloads that are very computationally intensive and offload them onto the GPU. These are GPUs. That's the CPU. Working together, we can take advantage of the best capabilities of both processors, one that is extremely good at sequential processing, the CPU, and a processor that's incredibly good at parallel processing called the GPU. This is accelerated computing. Not just parallel computing, but accelerated computing. CPU and GPU working together. The vast majority of everything we see in the world today running on computers are running on CPUs. But there's a new change, a fundamental change in the computing model. But in order to do that, you cannot just take the CPU software that's running sequentially and put it on a GPU to run parallel. We have to create a whole bunch of new algorithms. These are some of the 350 different libraries we have in our company, some very, very important libraries. Kuletho is for computational lithography. We take many weeks of computation and reduce it down to hours. We could, of course, speed up the cycle time of building chips, but very importantly, we also make it possible to advance the algorithms of lithography much, much more sophisticated so that we can advance semiconductor physics well beyond two nanometers, one nanometer, and beyond. So computational lithography is going to be accelerated by KuLitho. And then one of the most important libraries we ever created called KuDNN. KuDNN for deep neural networks, which processes the different layers, the various layers of the deep learning stack. It enabled us to do something extraordinary. By creating KuDNN and accelerating and democratizing deep learning, it enabled a change in the way that software is done. This is the way that software was done before, software 1.0. Software programmers writing code to describe an algorithm that's a function, that function is software. You then apply input, it predicts an output. That code written by human runs best on CPUs. Software 2.0, because the computer is now so incredibly fast, you can give it an enormous amount of example, observed data, so that it can learn, it can predict what the function is by itself. We call that software 2.0. So instead of coding, it is now machine learning. Instead of code running on CPU, it is now neural networks running on GPUs. And neural networks, these neural networks that are running on GPUs is now the formation of a new operating system, a new way of using computers, the operating system of the modern computer, large language models. This machine learning approach has proven to be incredibly scalable. You could use it for all kinds of things. Of course, digitized text, languages, of course, digitized sound, speech, images, video. It could be multimodal. You could teach it amino acid sequences. You could teach it to understand just about anything, anything where you have large observed data. Well, that was the first step, was to understand the meaning of the data. Just by studying an enormous amount of text on the internet, we were able to understand the words, the vocabulary, the syntax, grammar, and even the meaning of the words by finding patterns and relationships. 
we're now able to not only understand the meaning of the different data types, connect it to different modalities, for example, words and images. You can even have video and text to machine articulation, robotics. Each one of these combinations is a new industry, new company, new application use case. Incredible Cambrian explosion of the number of applications that have now been created. And we're just at the beginning. One of the properties of machine learning, of course, is that the larger the brain, the more data we can teach it, the smarter it becomes. We call it the scaling law. There's every evidence that as we scale up the size of the models, the amount of training data, the effectiveness, the quality, the performance of the intelligence improves. Every single year, the industry is scaling up the size of the models by 2x or so, which correspondingly need 2x the data, and therefore we need four times the amount of compute, the amount of computing resource necessary to drive to the next level of artificial intelligence is extraordinary. Well, when Strawberry, or, Ch or OpenAI's 0101 was announced, it exposed the world to a new type of inference. Inference is when you interact with the AI, just like ChatGPT. But ChatGPT is one shot. You ask it a question, you ask it to do something for you, whatever question you have, whatever prompts you provide, through one shot, it delivers an answer. However, we know that thinking is oftentimes more than just one shot. And thinking requires us to maybe do multi-plans, multiple potential answers that we choose the best one from, just like when we're thinking. We might reflect on the answer before we deliver the answer. Reflection. We might take a problem and break it down into step by step by step. Chain of thought. There are many different technologies that we've invented that makes possible for inference to perform better and better as we apply more and more compute. Now we have the second scaling law, inference scaling law. Not just generation of the next word, but thinking, reflecting, planning. These two simultaneous scale laws are going to require us to drive computing at extraordinary speeds. Every single time when we deliver a new generation, a new architecture, we increase the performance by x factors, but we also decrease the power by the same x factor. We decrease the cost by the same x factor. So driving up performance is exactly the same as reducing cost. Driving up the performance is exactly the same as reducing energy. And so, therefore, as the world continues to absorb and ad embrace artificial intelligence, it is our mission, it is our duty to continuously drive the performance up as fast as we can. AI is not a chip problem. These AI systems are enormous. This is the Blackwell system. Blackwell is the name of a GPU, but it's also the name of this entire system. The GPU is extraordinary in itself. There are two Blackwell dies. Each Blackwell die is the largest chip the world's ever made. 104 billion transistors made by TSMC in their most advanced 4 nanometer node. Two of these Blackwell dies are connected together across 10 terabytes per second low energy link, right, right in that middle right there. That line, that seam, thousands of interconnections between the two dies, 10 terabytes per second. It's connected by eight HBM3E memories from SK Hynix and from Micron. And these memories together run at eight terabytes per second. And the reason for that is because this system cannot work alone. Even the most advanced computer the world has ever made cannot work alone for artificial intelligence. In order to enable the, MV and the GPUs to work as one, we, of course, have networking, two CX-7s that connect 
this GPU with thousands of other GPU, but we still need this NVLink. This NVLink allows us to connect the few GPUs in one rack that's standing behind me, 1.8 terabytes per second, uh, th 35 times higher bandwidth than the highest bandwidth networking in the world, which allows us to connect all of these GPUs together to this NVLink switch. There are, there are nine NVLink switches in one rack. Each rack has 72 computers like this connected through this spine. What results are 72 of these computers connected as one large GPU. One incredibly large GPU. From the software perspective, it is just one giant chip. We designed this so that it can be configured as one superpod, like this, or one entire gigantic data center with thousands and thousands of them, hopefully hundreds of thousands of them. We can build AI supercomputers with these. We can integrate them into enterprise data centers, into hyperscalers, so that it can fit into every corner of the world's computing infrastructure. How do you program such an incredible computer? This is where NVIDIA software stack. All of the software that we created over the years integrated into the system makes it possible for everyone, anyone, to deploy AI supercomputers around the world, to build AI. And so what is AI? I think there are two types of AIs that will be extremely popular. The first AI is basically a digital AI worker. These AI workers can understand, they can plan, and they can take action. Support a customer. Come up with a manufacturing supply chain plan. Optimize a chip. Help us write software. These digital AI workers, we call them AI agents, are essentially like digital employees. You're going to see all kinds of different agents. And we created several things to make it easier for the ecosystem to be able to build AI agents for companies. Now, these agents are able to understand, reason, plan, take action. None of these agents can do 100% of anyone's task, anybody's job. None of the agents can do 100%. However, all of the agents will be able to do 50% of your work. This is the great achievement. Instead of thinking about AI as replacing the work of 50% of the people, you should think that AI will do 50% of the work for 100% of the people. AI will not take your job. AI used by somebody else will take your job. And so be sure to activate using AI as soon as you can. So the first is digital AI agents, digital. These are digital AIs. The second application is physical AI. The same basic technology is now embodied, sits inside a mechanical system. Of course, robotics is going to be one of the most important industries in the world. Until now, robotics has been limited. And the reason is very, very clear. As much as robots have driven the productivity of manufacturing, it has been very difficult to expand. The robotics industry has been largely flat for a long time. And the reason for that is because it is not flexible enough to be able to apply to different scenarios and different conditions and different work. We need AI that is much, much more flexible. In order to enable robotics to happen, we need to build three computers. The first computer is train the AI, just like we did with all of the examples I've given you so far. Second is to simulate the AI. You need to give the AI a place to practice, a place to learn, a place to, retreat, to receive synthetic data that it can learn from. We call that Omniverse. Omniverse is our virtual world digital twin suite of libraries that could be used for creating physical AIs, robotics. Omniverse 
then after validation, after training, after evaluation, then you can take the model and put it into a physical robot. Inside that, we have processors that are designed for robotics. We call it Jetson Thor. Thor is a robotics processor designed for human or robots. This loop goes on and on and on. It sees a world, it sees the video, it sees the surrounding, the circumstance. You tell it what you want, and this AI will generate articulation motion. Just as we take text, we can generate video. We can take text and generate articulation motion. Okay? So this concept is very similar to generative AI. And this is the reason why we think that now we have the necessary technology between Omniverse and all the computers that we built, these three computers, and the latest generative AI technology, that the time has come for human or robotics. There are only two robotic systems that can be easily deployed into the world. The first robot is a self-driving car. And the reason for that is because we created the world to adapt to cars. The second is human or robots. You use human demonstration and then mimic that environment using domain randomization generates hundreds of other examples like your demonstration so that the robot can learn to generalize. And so we're generating a whole bunch of tests, evaluation systems, evaluation scenarios that the robot can try to perform and improve itself, learn how to be a good robot. Not only will robots be autonomous, but remember that the future factories will also be robotic. And so these factories are going to be robotic factories that are orchestrating robots, building mechanical systems that are robotic. Car companies will have two factories in the future. One factory to build the cars. One factory to produce the AI that runs in the car. Well, this is the robotics revolution, and we want to go even faster to take advantage of the revolution of AI. As I said earlier, the computer industry has fundamentally changed from coding that runs on CPU to now machine learning running on GPUs. From an industry that produced software, we have now become an industry that is manufacturing artificial intelligence. And the artificial intelligence is produced in factories. They're running 24-7. When you license software, you install it into your computer, the manufacturing, the, the distribution of that software is complete. However, intelligence is never complete. These infrastructure, these factories, never existed before. It's a brand new thing, which is the reason why we're seeing so much development around the world. For the very first time, we have a new industry, a new factory, producing something brand new we call artificial intelligence. Every company will be an AI manufacturer, of course. No company can afford not to manufacture, produce artificial intelligence. How can any company afford not to produce intelligence? How can any country afford not to produce intelligence? It's a new industrial revolution. The last time this happened was 300 years ago when electricity was discovered. The generation of electricity and the distribution of electricity it happened during the Industrial Revolution. Now we have a new industry, never existed before. Artificial intelligence sits on top of the computer industry. But it's utilized, it is created by every industry. You have to create your own AI. The drug industry creates your own AI. The automotive industry creates your own AI. The robotics industry creates your own AI. Every industry, every company, every country must produce your own AI a new industrial revolution. Thank you, Japan. Have a great AI summit. Thank you.